My name is Christopher Merrill, and as the director of the International Writing Program, it's my pleasure to welcome you both here in the Iowa City Public Library and those of you watching at home for this special panel presentation titled Imagination Computation. While many writers have a fundamental faith in the endless capacity of the imagination, mathematics and computation are increasingly doing imaginations heavy lifting, offering seemingly endless varieties of predictability in its stead. But what is more unpredictable than the experiments of writers determined to plumb the depths of their souls? How to play this game in the face of AI and logarithms designed to maximize the profits of social media companies? These are the kinds of questions our distinguished panel of writers in the fall residency will discuss today. And if you'd like to find more of their work online, as well as their biographies and previous panel presentations, please go to www.iwp.uiowa.edu. Our speakers in order today, we will begin with Candace Chung, is a playwright, screenwriter, and translator from Hong Kong. Apart from writing drama, she has also collaborated on musical theater and opera productions as both writer and librettist. Selected by the South China Morning Post as one of Hong Kong's 25 most inspirational and influential women, she is a six-time winner of the Hong Kong Drama Awards, the recipient of a Best Artist Award in Drama by the Hong Kong Arts Development Council and of a number of international honors. Her plays have been performed on European and American stages, translated and published, and she participates in the fall residency courtesy of the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation. Seated next to Candice is Imam Bakish, a storyteller, children's book writer, and teacher from Guyana. He's the author of two award-winning young adult novels, The Dark of the Sea and Children of the Spider. His children's stories, too, have been frequently recognized. He has been a featured present presenter at literary festivals on both sides of the Atlantic. An advocate for Guyanese Creole, he runs a literary project and library for his community and owns and operates a kindergarten. His participation in the fall residency is made possible by the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown, Guyana. And our final speaker, Salah Obeid from the UAE, published her first short story collection, Alzheimer, in 2010, followed by Postman of Happiness in 2012 and iPad of Life in the Manner of Zorba two years later. Her collection, An Implicitly White Lock of Hair in 2015, won the Al Ois Award for Creative Writing. And her first novel, Maybe It's a Joke, appeared in 2018. A member of the Dubai Culture and Arts Authority Council and of the Association of Emirati Women Writers. In 2017, she was awarded the Young Emiratis Prize. Her participation in the fall residency was made possible by a grant from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Please join me in welcoming these writers to the Iowa City Public Library. Hi, this is Candice. I shouldn't have chosen this topic. It gives me stress. At first, it was the writing that stressed me out, as I'm a playwright. My way of thinking works in dialogues rather than article phrasing. And when I started to do research on the topic, I experienced more stress. As I realized computer scientists had invented new writing program, people nowadays could ask an AI to write a screenplay, and they had literally filmed it. How humiliating. Script writers are cheap labor, yet people still try to find a way to replace us. Feeling defeated, I spent a few days staying away from the desk, avoiding the deadline. I could not help but think an AI writer would not miss the deadlines like me. Poor Jonathan, 
is still waiting for my first draft for editing. The AI writer will not need such help because it does not make grammatical or spelling mistakes. It can even write in different languages. All you need is to, to do is to press a button. In fact, it can imitate writing style too from the writing samples people for, provided. I sat in my hotel room eating chips, gaining more weight, imagining how AI Shakespeare would analyze the collections of plays and write like Shakespeare. Who does not want Shakespeare to come back to life? I think only living writers don't. <laughs> Do I have anything better than the AI writer? I wander aimlessly on campus. I look at the reddish leaves and think about my writing process. I am hardworking. I read, I think, and I do a lot of interviews before putting my pen on paper. I immediately envy an AI writer's huge database where it can pull out all useful information for any target subjects in one second. Not to mention its good memory. I never record my interviews. I purposely let myself immerse in conversation, so sometimes I will forget important words, leaving a thin layer of air that will vanish if I don't jot it down right after the interview. Suddenly, a squirrel jumps out, reminding me of uh, the big raccoon running into our way when Gabriel and I walked back after an evening swimming session. It's so chubby, and makes me wonder how much food it has found from our university rubbish bin. But why does this raccoon pop up and how does its diet have anything to do with me? The AI writer will not be distracted. In fact, the AI writer does not really need a writing process. Unlike me, I went through so many twists and turns before reaching anything meaningful. Yet suffering doesn't always bring good work. Most of the time, the outcome is unpredictable. Audiences' response, unpredictable. Critics and reviews, unpredictable. But an AI writer can manage all these. It does calculations on popularities of characters and plots. It has the formula, right, formula. Researchers claim that they can install successful script formulas into future AI writers. Now this is official. The AI writer is set on the right path. It has a higher possibility to be successful. It is made to win. To win. I don't write to win. I might dream of being successful but I don't write to become successful. I think computation works better in the games they aim at winning, like chess. Being distracted means giving the opportunity to your opponent. Showing flaws might lose a point. A simple mistake leads to failure. Writing, on the other hand, is a game that aims for sharing. In this case, stress could be good, flaw could be good, mistake could be good, unpredictable could be good, limitation could be good, failure could be good. Because these are things we went through in life and the way we dealt with them have made our personalities. And our personalities give temperature, texture, death, color, whatever you call it, to our tests. They can be imitated only to a certain extent, and they are not written to win out or succeed. They are written to share, to communicate, to connect. Sometimes, when you read carefully enough, you will see the author's experiences behind the stories. 
some writers went through a lot to write. Loneliness, depression, nightmare, anger, even war. When they are honest about their weakness and show you their brutal struggles, it is not to win anything, but to shed light on a stranger who has similar struggles. Inventors can install a general personality to an AI writer, but I doubt if they have the experiences and emotions, especially the intention that is equivalent to what we have, that is the willingness to shed light on someone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is the afternoon of October 15th, 2021. At the podium almost as tall as she is, Diana Del Angel is describing a mass murder and its subsequent cover-up and exposure. Her quiet, clipped voice lends inescapable credibility to her narrative. Shambaugh House, home of the International Writing Program, is silent as it listens to factual horrors that are simply wrenching to anyone with a soul. No literary imagination came up with these cruelties. But the tale ignites emotion because of the writer's art in telling it. Diana skillfully chooses which parts of the dreadful narrative to share with us. Moments like one victim's wife finding out about his death when she sees his mutilated face on social media. The right details make a story coil and grow in the base of the reader's skull. But how would a writer know what those details are? Stanislaw Lem, whose 100th birthday we are celebrating in Iowa City this year, once wrote in his book, Siberiad, of the great constructor Trurl creating a machine that could write poetry. In tackling the challenge, the engineer had an epiphany, which was, the program found in the head of an average poet was written by the poet civilization, and that civilization was in turn programmed by the civilization that preceded it, and so on to the primordial chaos of the cosmic deep. Hence, in order to program a poetry machine, one would first have to repeat the entire universe from the beginning, or at least a good part of it. I think what he's saying here is that a human author crafts provocative images by harnessing specific cultural, personal, and localized experiences. John D. MacDonald, for instance, once evocatively described the stain under a broken air conditioner as being shaped like the lower half of Texas. Can a robot mind know that a stain would never be shaped like the rectangular state of Kansas? Probably not in today's world. Now, those of you who have read Siberia doubtless see the flaw in my argument, however, because in Lem's satire, Trurl and his entire society, which includes the poets, are themselves robots. Human experiences, preferences, can be reduced to data points. And as much as we consider human experience to be infinite, our literary preferences can indeed be mapped. One day, an AI will be able to use those charts to sail the most scenic routes between our emotions. Let's shift back a bit. It is the evening of May 11th, 1997. Deep Blue, a computer, is attempting to defeat a world chess champion for the first time. That champion, a human named Garry Kasparov, chooses to play a defense that has a known weakness. But Kasparov is banking on the computer not being willing to make an immediate sacrifice for future gain. By coincidence, however, the programmers feeding data to Deep Blue had taught it the path to that reward just that morning. 
For the first time in history, the inventiveness of the human champion loses to the power of computation. Nowadays, of course, only computers play chess, and humans don't bother since they can't compete, right? Well, actually, chess.com is among the 300 most relevant websites in the world, according to the Alexa ranking service, where humans are playing each other. And why, why are humans still playing a game that computers can do better? Chess is one of the biggest draws on the streaming service Twitch. Why do audiences still care? Players train with computers now to sharpen their skills, but then they play against each other with their phones turned off. What the audience wants is a story of human striving. And for many readers, only a human author will do, especially in literature, which thrives more than any other medium on the sense of directly plugging into the creator's mind. No doubt, a market for computer-generated stories will exist. And many authors will use AI as assistance to help them craft epic tales or to bridge some skill gap or just to save time. But just as we will always have a demand for organic food in the face of factory farming, we will see some books proudly proclaiming their organic authorship because that is what sells for a significant portion of the audience. Let's jump ahead. It is just before midnight on November the 5th, 2121. And AI has just developed the ability to train its successor more efficiently than humans ever could, creating an accelerating chain of intelligence that will take machines beyond human limits. Futurist novelists like Werner Winger call this the singularity, a moment where every conception we have of human history ends because we are, we are surpassed by our digital children. It will take a singularity to make a true poet out of a machine. And if we fall past that horizon, then literature will be the least of the things we'll be struggling to define. This will be a world where a machine can cook better than a human, remove cancers better than a human, and rock your baby to sleep with more care and devotion than you. What even is the point of human existence in such a world? Maybe a writer will tell us. Hello, good morning. Since I read Carl Chapek, play RUR Robots, written in 1920, I have been thinking of the confusing relationship between literature and technology. The robots, where the scientific designation came from, rebuild when they started having feelings. So this is a thing has always amazed me because before, like when the robots were invented, those machines wasn't having a name before literature. Karl Chabak, were, Karl Chabak was the one who named them and gave them their scientific um, term through literature. At this mysterious and ambious, ambious point, they were able to imagine and dream of their freedom in a world free from humans. As such, the robots could not have revoluted unless the exp they experienced feelings that later led them to the imagination of their free world and creative thinking and planning. To run away from the factory wherein their parts were created to serve human beings and to attain freedom. As such, uh, sorry, the play brought the idea of freedom and the imagination of it as a natural instinct and hope. To my attention from the first time, the desire for freedom began from the moment that robotic, robotic beings felt what attention 
uh, felt what seems to look like pulses in the same place where a human heart lies. Imagination is undoubtedly the essential pillar upon which a human creativity is based. So, can technology feel? When we use the word feel in this context, we truly mean it. We don't mean anticipate or analyze data as it, in, as it the case in smart devices here and there. So, can these robots have feelings and emotions strong enough to enable them to imagine? Many questions may be proposed when discussing the possibility upon which, ans which the answers would be based. For example, Jaguar, the, last car the large car manufacturing company, tested a moral question regarding the self safety, safety of, of the passenger when developing a series of its car that will be fully based on the AI technology. It is similar to a question one might ask oneself or even offer to others. Should I save myself to make the choice of, um, of protecting others? What is the driver of this smart car was about to collide with someone, something, the owner's pet, for example? In normal cases, the human driver will instinctively choose to, to divert from the road to protect both himself and the other creature. In doing so, he would also try to control the car to prevent the, coll to co prevent the collusion. But the case may be different with the smart Jaguar that puts the owner's life at the top of its priorities, which means it won't have to the barrier of morality that the humans have. So, colliding with the living object, a man, beloved bit, would mean the car would protect the owner's life, and it would do so without hesitation, meaning it would neither feel uncertain nor imagine the emotional consequences while making that decision. On the other hand, a human driver will imagine the dog's suffering agony and the departure of its soul from the body, a case that despite being expected by the machine would not be understood by it. Machines do not understand how imagination works. That is, takes place in abstract field parallel to reality, and that is can anticipate. Emotions employed with feelings, that is what generate imagination and is the basis of creativity with the passage of time. All AI machines will be able to accumulate and store knowledge in a manner that will make it possible for them to anticipate consequences and to make decisions quickly, as mentioned earlier. This accumulated knowledge is about to reach perfection and may become error-free. However, Accuracy-based perfection cannot produce feeling, feelings, nor the imagination it could generate with a wide range of possibilities of com complexities such as fragility, anger, or weakne weakness that humans feel. It goes without saying that creativity is part of this process. So, Chapek play turn it to reality one day, especially after the invention of robot. Could we create smart and sensitive beings that, like humans, could imagine and foster creativity? Who, who, who own human creativity and live imagination might leave this question unanswered. If with, if, if with concern to see how time will handle it for an electronic creature able to master this has not been created yet. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, before we turn to questions, uh, I want to remind you about some upcoming events. Our Shambaugh House reading this afternoon will be live on Zoom at 5 p.m. Uh, with Muti Nilema, uh, Ko'isat Rustamov, Rustamova, 
and Dominika Slowick. That's at 5 o'clock. Cinematech will be on this Sunday at 6 o'clock in the Adler Journalism Building, room 105. Lee Chang Dong's Burning will be hosted by Kim Hana. Next Friday here at the Public Library, we will host our fourth public panel of the residency. The topic is Rituals and Traditions. And the panelists will include Sarah Blau, Deanna Del Angel, who was just mentioned in Imam's talk, uh, Mei Yue, and Alexandra Kay. Also next Friday, we hope you'll join us for another Shamba House reading featuring Sanam Mahar, Salah Obayad, and Fari Oz. And uh, if you could let uh, Hugh get to you for the questions, uh, or John, John V is going to actually take the questions so that we can hear them on the microphone uh, so that people at home can hear. So the floor is yours. And maybe while we're waiting for a question, I, I have one thing that came to mind. Uh, in Candace, you talked to, about the uh, uh, stress could be good, flaw could be good, mistakes could be good, unpredictable could be good, limitation could be good, failure could be good. It seems to me that we're speaking often in these, these, these papers about uh, the importance of human weakness or human uh, failure. Um, would you want to talk a little bit about what some of those failures or limitations, uh, we know what the stress is and how it gets relieved by the thought of the raccoon and the squirrel, but some of the other flaws that, that make for what can only be created by a, a human being. Uh, I I I always uh, I always feel like making mistakes and learning from mistakes is uh, it stick longer in my mind mm -hmm. than doing it right at the first time, mm -hmm. and then there's just so many possibilities in making choices in in one's lifetime. So I I, I I'm I'm very obsessed with talking you know interviewing different people because I see, I, I, I came out from uh, studying psychology. I know that general description of uh, some group of people. But every time when I talk to an individual, how the life experiences affecting him or her and how they brought up in a different background just is fascinating. I think it's always very unique, and you can find the details that's, uh, that will ring your bells. And most of the things that uh, attracted me the most, uh, the, the thing that attracted me the most is um, how they make mistakes mm -hmm. and uh, how they overcome their weakness. And I, I just find it fascinating. That's why it always sticks in my mind. Yeah. Beckett ends the novel, Fail Again, Fail Better. Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, I would like to add to that. Uh, who is the painter that does the joy of painting, that old PBS? Um, Bob Ross. Was that? Bob Ross. Right, so you made me think of Bob Ross right away. Bob Ross is uh, memed as a symbol of wholesomeness on the internet all over the world. Millions of people have taken solace in him, especially during the pandemic that calm aspect he has of making you feel comfortable with your humanity. And one of the phrases that is his most memed, probably, is where he talks about making happy little mistakes. As you paint, your hand will slip, and you will mar your intended image. But then you incorporate that into what you were building, and you end up with something different and better. And you forgive yourself for that mistake, and you build on it, and you still achieve um, art, and you still build something that you can be happy with. So I know that's painting, but I think it applies to writing as well. And that's purely from the writer's point of view. Um, I don't think, just as my analogy with chess, that computers being winning, as you said, right? Computers winning at writing will not stop us from ever trying to write. Yeah. Um, 
for me, um, I think I remembered, I think the opening of Anna Karnina, which is say all the happy families are looks the same. And with IA, it's always like going to the perfection thing, to the best of the best of the best of anything. And for me, this is not creativity. Creativity lies in, you know, in the parts or the areas where we discover our weakness and our darkness. Um, it's not a very bright thing. Um, the literature is, as I see it. And it's a thing, I think, the IA is not able to discover it and won't. I think they will be won't, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Zena. Uh, I got a question. And, uh, uh, thank you for um, presenting this. and. I could see that uh, you author's point of views, and I could understand. And I, I got questions from here. Uh, if you authors could use AI editor or translators, yeah, <laughs> how do you think of these uh, uh, issues? So, did you? If you didn't hear the question, if you use. AI translator yeah. or editor, how will you, will you use it and how do you use it? Actually, um, I'm, I'm using, you know, I, I think it will be good to use the, uh, the AI um, uh, translators and, or editors, but I know that the editor job is similar to the writer somehow, some way. It's not only, you know, fixing the, the mistakes, he can, you know, rebuild your story again. So I don't think I will go with the um, the AI um, or AI artificial intelligence um, editor, but I think it's with you know the corrector or the things that is go as long with the translating. Sometimes it will be like nice to have them, but we are already having ones, so I'm not sure what they will add more. Um, and still, it's some it's related to your creativity somehow, some way. So I don't know how artificial intelligence devices will be, you know, stick to the idea of weakness and complexities that is already there in, you know, the literature and creative part. Clippy must die. How many of you know who Clippy is? <laughs> so long time ago, Microsoft tried to put into Word an assistant. Uh, in the shape of a paperclip, and he would say things like, oh, you seem to be writing a letter. Can I help you and format mm -hmm. it for you and things like that? And it is the most hated product in Microsoft history. Um, I'm only joking, of course. Depending on the skill level that the AI achieves and how trainable it is, and I can say to it, these are my preferences. When you edit me, um, don't tell me about this stuff. I know it's grammatically incorrect, or I know the train of thought wanders, etc. But if the AI can be responsive to me and trainable in that way, I have no hesitation using it as an editor. I, 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 last night I was just, I've never d done that, but I suddenly, sometimes I write long paragraphs of Chinese on. <laughs> on my social media and last night I was just suddenly thinking how 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 did they translate? Because I saw some of my friends who who don't speak Chinese, they they like it. So I was just curious well, how how will it look? And then I looked into the translation. Actually it was pretty good but still I can see like it's missing something. And so for me I think you know, for a quick translation like 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 it must say, like, depends on the, the skill you need. For social media, just like to have an... I, I hope the, the people who read it in the translation don't think that I literally speak in this way. I wish they would come back to me. So not to mention about the, the translation of my artwork, I don't think I... For, for now, I won't trust um, AI translator at this moment. <laughs> Thank you. Add to your workload that you now have to correct the translation as part yeah. of the writing process. Yes. Yeah, this is just a follow through on um, on Hena's question. So, um, as you were all talking, you were um, romantically uh, making a case for the human, more or less, Iman, with some reservations, extra reservations. Uh, but if and um, 
So you said editor and translator are slightly different. But you know, one of the first functions that the Kindle um, devised when it first came on the market was that it would tell not, not just the author, but also the publisher, at what point people slowed down in reading. So um, in other words, they would be following along, and at some point, they would abandon the text, let's say. If you get a note from your editor at your publishing house that none of no, no reader finished reading past page 111. Would that in any way influence the way in which you would go back to the text and start thinking? Maybe for the next text, etc. But would that, so from the perspective of the reader, um, it supplies information that's unconvertible and at the same time disturbing. So, yeah. <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> I'm curious why you picked 111. Where I come from, <laughs> where I come from, that is an unlucky number. As a, <laughs> as, as a cricketer, 111 is considered terribly unlucky. <laughs> um, but what you're talking about is an enhanced feedback mechanism. I think all writers use um, a feedback reader of some kind, and we're always looking for feedback on various things. Nowadays, for example, a lot of people use sensitivity readers. And you like, I'm not gay. I'm writing a gay character. I want to make sure that this character doesn't step into stereotype or offensiveness. Let me find someone who can help me, or you know, uh, someone who is Indian, or whatever it might be that you're reaching beyond yourself for. So feedback in terms of where, and one of the things I always ask my feedback readers is specifically, what are the boring parts? I really care about that. So if there was some weaponized product that says to me, everyone found this boring, I really care. And I don't have a problem listening to that. Now, if the thing says to me, you should change it so that it does this, then I will tell it to F off. <laughs> because I will replace it with what I think works. And maybe the feedback comes back that that doesn't work either. And I will try 100 times, and I keep being told it's not working. But it will be 100 times of what I want to put down, not what somebody told me might work or would work. I still find it in the analyzing part. Like, you know, it's still the job that usually the artificial intelligence are doing. They are predicting and analyzing and assuming the things. So it's not very different to the things that they are doing nowadays. And I think that it's not really related to the creativity part we are, you know, engaged with. And we are, you know, um, usually it's more complex than that. So I think it might be a very helpful, you know, tool to know where to change something. But as Imam said, he, he doesn't need to tell me that what I need to do here. But the prediction or analyzing that he, it's giving to me, it's like will be a helpful tool for me. I was, I was going to say, that's why I don't care about feedback. No matter if it's AI <laughs> or human being, I would, I would rather write in my own way because there are like just too many, too much inference, too many different voices from, uh, it only get away from what you are trying to write. And so I, I, I was just hoping, like, if the publisher is not going to publish it, I will photocopy it and then send to my friends, and hopefully it will get something. Because, uh, yeah, like um, Sarah so said, I, I always doubt about well, what, it, what is the, how, how is this, if you talk about science, uh, what is the sample audience? Like, who are reading it? The, like, are they, are they given the Kindle as well as the, their iPhone? because they are not going to concentrate on any books anyway. But I, I, I trust there are always some, is always reflecting some, some truth in it about the market. But I, I tend to think that is the business people who manage the market, but not the, right, the writer or the artist. Thank you. <laughs> Poor poet. Yeah. <laughs> Answer questions? Yeah. 
So um, I've often wondered, part of the conversation we have as writers and as an audience thinking about our, um, the way the discourse works now, particularly with social media, is often this fear that uh, the algorithm will become so powerful that it outsmarts us. But I often wonder in response to that, um, and if either of you have noticed this in the way the discourse works, that it's not the algorithm will outsmart us, it's that we ourselves will become the algorithm in the way that we make sense of the world. And I often find this, um, the discourse around art and art making spaces, the use of art, um, why we write, why we produce, seems a little bit more algorithmic than it might have been before. I'm wondering if this is something that you've noticed in um, the spaces in which you produce your work. <laughs> Actually, um, if I understood like your your question well, I think um, the algorithm, the algorithm. If we went to the, the creativity part, it might seems that it's focused on a special subject or you know specific subject that will be if the writer write for example about this subject in this place he will be successful and etc for example when if if you are living in the middle east the first you know subject he need to write about or she need to write about is you know how unstable the things are there and how the people are living you know and lack of a freedom and lack of free of speech and etc which is at the end of the day is a first thing, which is at the end of the day, a lot of writers might do that without noticing that they are forced or they are, you know, um, pushed to write about this because this is how the world think about specific areas and how this, how the numbers later with, you know, the selling part and, you know, when the publisher want to publish a specific subject about some place. Um, so I don't think that is that this part is related exactly to the um, artificial intelligence things. It's us, as you mentioned at the first part, at the first, you know, at the first part of your question. It's us who, you know, assume and make these assumptions right uh, regarding the market later. Uh, could I ask you to clarify something? You said it's not that the algorithm outsmarts us, but that what? Us. Oh, well, I think uh, my reference to Lem deals with that. Because when he says that you program a poet through that civilization, and that civilization was programmed by that civilization, I think he's talking a lot about stuff like evolutionary pressures um, and cultural transmission. And so we are not born um, knowing what our priorities and preferences and uh, things are in our life, we, we get acculturated into that based on what um, our parents were acculturated to. So there is a, an internal algorithm going here at all times. I think what an AI would end up doing is simply mapping that and then working through it. Because if the AI ever said, we need stories about ships, only ships, nothing else, people would not necessarily respond to that because you know, it's, the AI has made a mistake in evaluating what our internal algorithm that's driving our tastes is. So the AI could probably only ever map what we already as a cultural and evolutionary creature is looking for. I'm sorry, after listening to the answer, I still don't quite get the, I know, I understand what you're talking about, but I don't quite understand the questions. Can, can, do you want me to answer or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> then can you uh, ask again? <laughs> um, I, I guess to the, uh, to the point on the market and the way that market influences the kinds of stories that we think we should tell uh, about a location, about the kind of person who lives here at this time. Um, I wonder if that's, if for me, that way of thinking is sometimes algorithmic. It's kind of thinking like, ah, these are the inputs. This is what my audience expects. This is, uh, you know, this part of Australia that I'm writing about. Therefore, I have to talk about the kangaroos or the whatever it is. <laughs> and so I'm expected in some ways to fulfill this. And I imagine, I wonder if that at all relates to our questions of algorithms, because that is just data input and matching what people expect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 
and, and how we as writers can work around that so as to um, maintain some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, surprise or um, contradiction to what it is that people think we should produce. I see. I, I hope I, um, I think a lot, I, I try to keep myself like free from any restriction, but still sometimes we will get some commission work with certain topic or you have to write for certain kind of uh, audiences, like kids is another different uh, skills. But I have uh, such belief that um, because I'm writing play and then it's all about fun and, uh, and emotion and, and dramatic, and, and I need to get into the characters. So I try to fall in love with you know, if I cannot fall in love with the okay. commission work or topics, I I could never do it well. So I I I I I also take commission work, or I also take I also take job or writing that write to certain market. But the first priority is that I have to spend enough time with the topic and make myself fall in love with it, and and that that works quite well. I think I. Sometimes I feel like if I have no um, title given to me, I would like. I feel like I I don't have anything to. Follow. So sometimes it's good to have someone giving you. Okay, I want you to write about, and then it actually helped me to explore something that I've never thought about exploring, and I take that trip very precious too. So, but yeah, uh, in in short, I think it's important to make the very unique connection with the things that you're writing. Okay. And um, I'm really fascinated by this whole idea, so I, I have more to say. So this cultural algorithm, we could imagine that we're all as writers and readers operating within. I think it's one of the reasons we have cliche and irony. Because um, the, the algorithm grows stale and we get cliche. We want to break free of the algorithm and we have irony. And so we get these movements in history. So, you know, the realists reprimanding the romanticists in the late 1900s is saying, no, that's wrong. Don't do it that way. Change. And then we get counter movements. And so there's a conversation happening. And the algorithm is shifting because uh, we're still trying to dial up and get freshness out of it. So the algorithm is seeking out entertainment. It's seeking to break free of boredom. So whenever the algorithm gets stale, the algorithm will itself shift focus. Now, can an AI do that? I know that AI are writing novels and poets. My brother came to me. He's like, you're going to be unemployed. <laughs> Robots are writing novels now. <laughs> so I don't quite know where the technology is presently, but I don't imagine that the AI has that grasp of cliche and irony yet. And when it starts to get that, we're going to see a real leap in the quality of the work. And maybe we can reimagine that the AI is writing real literature at that point. You know, all, all this discussion makes me uh, feel like I, I keep having these questions. If an AI can write uh, very properly, I mean, everybody like, is like, can a mother be replaced by a robotic mother? It, I, I, is, is all these questions pop up in my mind? Can we really be replaced by AI in, in some like teaching, uh, motherhood, uh, art? Uh, I think I think it might. Some people might get some satis, satisfaction, uh, but I still feel like a large number of people will like that touch, uh, physical, I mean, human being, uh, warmth in it, uh, which is very complex. Uh, it, uh, yeah. Have you seen a child being babysat by YouTube? What? A child being babysat, babysat by YouTube. Uh, they, are they very happy? They seem to be. I... No, but I think if we... You know, long-term psychological <laughs> problems. Yeah, that now. is a good point. <laughs> I, I, I make no um, claims about the effectiveness of it, okay. just that it seems like
people are willing yeah, to, to take that this. alternative. Yeah, and I think the scary part will come because now we are having this. Um, we are able, you know, to um, doubting the artificial intelligence. Mm. But I think the scary part will come when we will stop doubting them, or when will will be when we will be not able to doubt them. I think this is where the scary part will start. And regarding, you know, the robots and the artificial intelligence, I think during the COVID, COVID times, we discovered that we need the humans more. And we need this, you know, you know, the soft touches and, you know, not, not be surrounded by the machine all the time, but, you know, um, the Zoom meeting all the time. We need to be with each other. Um, I don't know. It's an important thing that we notice that we are not yet ready to get rid of it anymore. And I take that word back because I, I just think about a lot of real parents cause more <laughs> psychological problems to <laughs> children. <laughs> Yeah. Not every parent has the right algorithm running. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might want to interject here. What do you think the role of discovery would be in such a scheme? Because it strikes me that AI could create a novel mm. following old patterns of writing novels. Yeah. But I'm going to guess that at least some of you, when you're in the act of writing, you don't know what you're next going to do. And the really thrilling moment comes when you think, oh, why don't I try that and see what happens? And it takes you to some place you haven't been before. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it's something not related also because I still see the artificial intelligence things are usually analyzing. They are analyzing all the time. Mm -hmm. And even they accumulate knowledge through analyzing. Mm -hmm. While we are writing, the creative part, is, it's totally not about analyzing so and predicting. We just don't know. And they cannot don't know. They will freak out, I think, the AI, yeah. AI if they didn't know the answer, straightforward. And I remember, like, because now we are talking about creativity, and I remember this story my friend told me about Eisenhower when he was sitting, I think, in front of a computer or artificial intelligence, the first like device of it or something like this. And he made a question for that device. Do you know God? Or do you know what's the meaning of the God? And the machine like was, you know, trying to analyze thing. And uh, it responded by, uh, no, he asked, is there a God? And the response was, now there is, after analyzing. That it's, it's a very scary answer, actually, <laughs> and a very weird thing. But now we are discover, like, like discussing creativity, and it seems they, they are having a, like a larger plan or a very ambitious, ambitious plan more than you know, only writing an novel or something like this. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm uh, getting it uh, right. I, I, I just realized that sometimes I used to write with an ending in front of me. I feel like I'm going to that direction. But after certain years, I realized that if you set in this way, the possibility in between the journey is very limited. So I tend, and then I gradually realize that if I don't think about the ending, I just go along the flow. And the human brain is very interesting that you will add spontaneously with any little details that change. And then you just follow through without, without knowing where you're going is scary sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's also very fascinating because you surprise yourself. Maybe you fall down, but then you will like, you, you do it again and then you find another uh, uh, path to go along and then I feel like it always reached to something more colorful or, or rich. Uh, yeah. I'm just thinking the wonderful American novelist Francine Prose reports that she got to the end of one novel and realized that she was writing it and realized on the last page that the major character was actually a rabbi. Yeah. And uh, she said, oh, so it's a religious novel. But she had no, no idea until she got to page 210 and then went back and revised accordingly. Yes. I think we had some questions in here. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I think we're talking about AI and, and writing in that way, in this very sort of remote, calculated, kind of clinical 
way. There was this really beautiful article, I can share it in our group afterwards, um, that came out recently where this writer who had lost a sibling, I can't remember if it's a brother or a sister, there's all these platforms that exist where um, the person you've lost, they somehow, I don't know how it works, but that person talks back to you. It's a text-based thing, it's almost mm -hmm. like chatting. And she wrote this really beautiful long-form piece, which was her in conversation with the sibling. And in that conversation, the, there was like the threads of like this memory that they had together, but then it, it sort of kept growing and kept changing. And it was in her sibling's voice, it was a lot of details taken from their life, um, and it really comforted her, uh -huh. but it was also beautiful to see how this story emerged where she was in conversation with an album, uh -huh. essentially. And we're talking about AI and all of this in this very remote way, but do you guys think that there is room for there, to, I mean, if we are the ones creating it, if we're feeding it what we need, that there will be room for that emotion, for that feeling, for that human connection, all of the stuff that we get from our writing, from our anyone that makes any kind of art. Like, don't you think we're going to move towards that or we're already there in some form? Um, actually, this is exactly what, what Chabik was mentioning in his play, because in this play, one of the robots, which is a female robot, will fall, I think, in love with uh, a human character from the play. And she will be the one who will try to save the humans. It's the opposite now. And um, because they were like planning to destroy humans, get rid of them because they are just awful for them. Um, and actually, it started all from the part of feelings. And I don't know, I still, because I did some research, they still working with algorithms, with accumulating knowledge, but not with real feelings that they don't understand. We are having a lot of feelings that we need time to understand and try to, uh, to, f to know what is this feeling exactly. They don't have this you know, ability yet. So I don't think that we reach there yet. So. Um, you bring up an interesting point that I, just last week, my favorite futurist, he's a YouTuber named Isaac Arthur, he did a video on criminal AI. And one of the things he looked at is that the information you've put out there publicly on your social media is enough for an AI to harvest and make a simulation of you mm. that could call up your best friend and say, hey man, do you remember what the Wi-Fi password was? And so break into your personal security. Um, but you've taken it the other direction now, and you're saying, well, yeah, you can simulate someone for a positive. And yeah, I can see that being um, definitely something that happens. So I barely touched on it in my presentation because I was trying to get to a basic idea. But I think the reality of what AI and writers are going to be doing in the future the vast majority of us will have an AI at our side. I mentioned the chess players training with an AI. They, they use that to operate at a high level during training. They have their databases, they have their analysis engines going. I think I could imagine a world where Stephen King has written 600 novels, not 60, because it only takes him two weeks. <laughs> and he has so many ideas and it overflows and he just keeps going. I'd like to live in a world like that. The AI works in reverse too. I can read 600 books in a week if an AI helps me funnel it. So I think we will incorporate that AI and we may have a personal relationship with that AI as it learns from us and our preferences and the types of stories we tell. And we'll be able to uh, work with the AI as a tool, and I don't know if it'll be a friend or it'll be as close to a friend as you could probably get without being human. Yeah. I, I, when I was writing this paper, I tried to remind myself not to let my own limitation on my imagination on you know, the developments mm -hmm. of the future AI thing. But, um, but yeah, I, 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 when you talk about how about you know, we feed them up every day and then make them. I, I just question why do I have to have another copy of myself? You know, even when I'm bringing up my child, although I really wish that you do it this way, but on the other hand, I was like, well, I really want him to develop like 
his unique self. So that's why. But but using it as a tool, I I, I remember I uh, watched some uh, filmed AI writers work. I think they try to make it like a buddy, like someone to talk to them, mm. give them uh, other possibilities of how to creating the story. It, it is okay. But having a friend who is not totally not working in this industry, I, I would say maybe is, is even more uh, helpful because it gives you something that is out of the box instead of an AI who knows writing but actually is just repeating some things other people do. Yeah. It seems like a marvelous place to end up. Actually, we have one more. Okay. Um, this is the last question. Thank you. Uh, when Ken has mentioned that, you know, you asked a question whether AI can replace a mom, I just, I was thinking, you know, a few years ago, we have a film, Her, right? Yeah. It's about this, you know, girlfriend. Love her, yes. AI lover. But recently also there's a German film, like Ich bin dein Mensch, I'm your man. It exactly explores, you know, how to switch the gender role mm -hmm. that um, a female intellectual actually sort of uh, pays to develop AI boyfriend. But exactly like what you mentioned, um, the boyfriend actually has a flaw in detecting the human emotion. So mm -hmm. emotion and a flaw, I feel you emphasized are probably exactly something attract real human as well. When I think of China, um, they actually created the virtual singer. They just mm. projected Luo Tianyi, his name, and she can just sing based on the computer generated pitch. And they also recreated very famous in, um, singer like Teresa Tang to sing, although she already passed away in 1995. So mm -hmm. they sort of recreated this image. When you think of, for example, TV show, they also have a virtual entertainment yeah. show host. In fact, one of the TV stations just announced they're going to use it and use it on TV satellite TV show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just keep thinking what you mentioned. Maybe you are also all from the group of serious writers, right? When I think of, for example, the pornography, they actually generated all the stimulating words to create a pornography. I was wondering whether it actually depends on the market and readers to decide. You know, maybe we eventually will just separate for those who do not really care about you know, who mm. who's developing those yeah. texts. They, they're going to just consume anything possible, maybe based on efficiency, based also on how publishing house want to make money and oh. so on. But I guess, you know, in IWP writers will never have that issue because <laughs> you Maybe, Maybe in the future, the market will also Maybe branding. Will yeah. Those are real writers, real human writers program. <laughs> We're not AI, but eventually become a sort of branding thing, you know, which is separate. But if, if I can raise that question, maybe uh, I just want to ask whether, whether you think that would be also the possibility to move in commercially or publishing house, you know, decide for whom they create. Maybe they include AI writers, but they certainly will brand real human writers like you. <laughs> Chris, you will be such a pioneer if next year the WPI have one <laughs> AI writer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like... <laughs> what did you say? You'd be a pioneer if IWP had an AI writer? writer in, in the oh, I thought you were going to say he'd be a pioneer if he invited a pornography writer. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you even more stress, <laughs> yeah, not on my watch. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, that, thank you for a thank really fabulous for sure. conversation here today. Mm -hmm.